Hey everybody, I'm Roger Murrah and I'm picking it out with Andrew Pope. Well, it's another podcast. Just called Picking It Out. It's another podcast, y'all. Just call Picking It Out. Got the Hall of Fame songwriter Roger Murrah in the house. And we're gonna be picking it out. Well, hey, y'all. As always, as always, the guitars. A little bit out of tune, but that's just how they, that's how they get. Just like all of us, I guess. I appreciate y'all tuning in once again to Picking It Out. And my name's Andrew Pope, and we've got a somewhat of a legend here with us today. This guy's had uh, so many number one songs uh, recorded by so many artists. It's just... uh, we can go on and on with the list. He's a member of the uh, Nashville Songwriter Hall of Fame. He's got a star in the Walk of Fame in the Alabama Music Hall of Fame, uh, which I'm sure he's very proud of. That's a, that's a really cool deal down there in Tuscumbia. For anybody that's never uh, seen that place, go check out that Alabama Music Hall of Fame. But... Uh, we're going to get into it here with uh, Roger Murrah. So how you doing, man? Hey, Andrew. I'm doing fine, buddy. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you for being here, man. I've been uh, been kind of you, sick. You know what? I, ju- I just realized you look like a younger Jamie Johnson. Uh, Tony with Stanton. a shorter beard, better looking. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Tony Stampley told me somewhat of that kind of same thing one time. Is he that said, right? He said I reminded him of a younger Jamie. And me and my wife was watching something uh, with Jamie the other day. And she said, my God, y'all could be brothers, like looking in the <laughs> eyes that's, or something. That's true. You're both from Alabama, right? Both from Alabama. He's from uh, he's from L.A. and I'm from N.A. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm from NA too. You're from Athens, ain't you? Yeah. 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 They got a new Bucky's out there. Have you been out that's there? That's what I heard, man. That's what, that's what I, I used to. I used to stop at a spur station. They'd give you a glass with your fill up. Yeah. You remember the spur stations is 20, 29 cents for a gallon. That's unbelievable. Even think about it. <laughs> yeah. That's unbelievable. I mean, they, you can't get nothing for twenty nine cents now. I know you man. barely buy they a don't quarter pay for it. Tax on it? No, sure don't. Oh, uh, well, you know, uh, it was uh, seventy two when you left Alabama, I believe, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. I, I moved up here in seventy two. And Bobby Bear had something to do with some of that, didn't he? Yeah, Bobby. I had met Bobby when he brought his wife down to record at our studio. We had a studio, me and three other guys over in Huntsville called Contention with a K. And um, he brought Jenny down there to, to record. And that's how I met him. So then I went, then years later, I go up to Nashville to try to book Bobby for a J.C. Fair there in uh, uh, Athens, and he asked me what I was doing, and uh, I told him I was kind of in between things, which means I didn't have anything going on. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, he said, you have any songs with you? I said, well, I have one out in the car, and it was called Send Tomorrow to the Moon. I told him it was a little pop sounding 
and uh, but I'd be glad to play, play it for him. And so I played it, and he liked it, and later on he recorded it. But he said, how would you like to come up here and sign on my company? And uh, he gave me a $50 draw. I said, man, I'll, I'll be glad to. So I was, I was tickled about that. Actually, prior to that, Andrew, I, I love to mention that uh, Rick Hall actually signed me to my first exclusive songwriting agreement, and um, I came in on leave from the, from the Army, took my mother over to Rogersville to look for shoes, and so I just drove on over and spoke to Rick, and he signed me up, but through the years, I've told people he would sign anybody that could hold a pencil at that time. <laughs> so I was, I was glad. I'll tell you, I, I love the Muscle Shoals history. Oh, I'm glad to be a very small part of it. It's uh, with, with Rick too. I mean, he you hear so many stories. I never met Rick Hall, but I, my I'm sure you know Martin Armour. Yeah, yeah. He's you know, a, I just, I met, I just met, no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I had him mixed up with somebody else. Uh, yeah, I, I actually wrote a song with Mark, uh, it's been several, several months ago now. Yeah. He, uh, he, you know, had the Rick thing too, and he wrote for fame for a long time and that's how he got moon over Georgia, you know, recorded. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Good song. Oh, great song. But you yeah. know, he's told me so many times about these eccentric, just crazy ass stories about Rick Hall. Uh, and then you go back and you watch like footage that Muscle Shoals documentary w was really good. I really enjoyed it. Man, I'm telling you, Andrew, let me say that's one of the best documentaries I have ever seen. I think I would have enjoyed it even if it wasn't music related. Yeah, I agree. And that guy was, that was his first ever producer or, or whatever you call it. Uh, hmm. I think it was a producer, the producer, but, uh, man, I love that documentary. That was great. Oh, the, uh, yeah. It, Rick was very eccentric and, uh, but you know what, right, right before he died, I had the best opportunity in the world. I, I ran into he and his wife at the Cracker Barrel at Harding place here in Nashville. And uh, I was able to tell him how much I appreciated him and how much, how proud I was of him because he, he really did a lot for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, he had his ways like everybody, but I'll tell you what, man, he, he's an icon if there ever was one. Yeah, well, and I'm, and he had a very tragic life. You know, I, that was the saddest thing about that documentary. He went through some stuff, man. Woo. Yeah. He, uh, we, there was a big hole in muscle shells after we lost him. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that, that hole will never be filled. You, uh, how did that come about with him for you? Well, I had I had a little band uh, years before that called Jamie Hurt and the Maritines. <laughs> I was actually Jamie Hurt, you know. <laughs> I think I own the PA system, and if you own the PA system, you're the singer, you know. <laughs> yeah, so uh, he we we recorded uh, a little forty five over there, and uh, he engineered it. And I didn't realize how historical or his, yeah, historical that was going to be in the long run, <laughs> but we cut a pretty good little record and, um, but old Rick engineered it and that's how I got to know him. Mm. And he just took a liking to you or saw something in you. And well, you know what? I think, uh, he kind of liked what I played him that day and, uh, I really do think he was <clears throat> just taking advantages of opportunities as they came by because, you know, he's sitting out there in the middle of a cotton patch trying to make it in the 
in the music business. And then he ended up doing me a, a great favor. He, he actually let me out of the contract to come to Nashville to do country music. Wow. And after I got here, I realized that's exactly where I belonged, you know? Yeah. And I love the history of country music and feel like I really fit here. But, but my background was R&B, man. I loved what was going on in most shows. And so I mixed my R&B roots with my country influence, and it's really affected my melodies through the years. But, uh, but I've told people, I thought he did me a favor, but he may not have been that into my song back in those days. <laughs> he <laughs> he might have been glad to get rid of me. <laughs> Uh, you've had some, you've had some good songs and melodies and really Thank you, sir. unique. I think I've always thought that. Um, Thank you, man. I, I've been a very, very blessed man. I, I'll be the first to tell you that, and the last to tell you. I tell you what, man. It's, uh, I just, uh, I pursued the dream and never gave up. I never, I never really doubted that I'd. I'd make it one day, but uh, it was uh, it took a lot of hard work and a lot of a lot of people helped me, you know. Yeah. Hey, you know, going back to Bear. Uh, yeah. I actually spent the night with him and Jeannie a few years ago, and we wrote some songs. And Bobby also was the first person after I got the master for my last record from the studio. I went mm-hmm. over there to their house and he's got a little Bose CD player and he listened to that whole thing. It's like over 60 minutes. It's it's the only bad reviews that it got was it was too long, but I don't care. But he listened to that whole <laughs> thing and spit in a cup the whole time, just listening to it and the whole thing. I mean, didn't even take his phone calls or nothing. And That's amazing, man. He, he, was it an album or what? Yeah. My last album, it was in 20, uh, 17 okay well good man hey uh, do you sing as good as jamie does oh no <laughs> <laughs> no jamie uh he's he's just uh, he's just unique he's just one of a kind i think man he is and he is a heck of a writer yeah and i love his singing man i'll tell you what he yeah he he makes himself a part of that song he does and, uh, a good friend of mine, Jimmy Melton. I don't know if you do know Jimmy. He um, he plays guitar on the road with Jamie. Did, uh, did they? Is he in that uh, that 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 band, uh, or did he used to be in that? Uh, uh, at they played the thing at the station in. Uh, I don't know if he R- uh, something R- He may have something RPM he, or something like that. I don't. I don't know for sure. But uh, Jimmy is quite a musician and a writer as well. He, he and Neil Cody, who used to write for me, they wrote uh, "She Was." It's about his mother. Mm-hmm. That that uh, trying to think of the artist's name now. Mark Chestnut. Yeah. Oh yeah. Great, great song, man. Yeah. Oh. Uh, you know, Bobby Baird is. Uh, he's one of those old song men, you know, he, he was, he was a true song man. I feel like he, Oh man, let me tell you, man, I can tell you a lot about Bobby. He, he had golden ears, man. He listened, he knew, he knew songs as well as anybody and better than most in Nashville. And, you know, he was the first to record a lot of people like Tom T. Hall. Yeah. Christopherson. Yeah. Uh, Billy Joe Schaefer, who he signed, and Billy Joe was with him when when I signed with Bobby. And at night, I'd go down to the office there and listen to Billy Joe's songs, and I thought, what in the world am I doing here? This guy's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. And uh, But Billy Joe told me one time, he said, uh, he said, you know, once you get a song or two out, he said, if people want to find – if they like your music, they'll come to you to get it, you know. But I think that was truer of Billy Joe than it was of me. But I tell you what, man, 
he was one of the Texas poets. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. But, yeah, Bobby, man, I'm telling you, I can't say enough about him. He he really affected a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Of course, most a lot of people know the story that he, he got Waylon signed. Yeah. And um, I'm glad to know that you have a history with him. How did, how did you end up going to his house? Uh, I met him at a show. It was a benefit that uh, he did. And I was on the bill with him and just, okay. him, just him and cue ball rode in a car together down there. It was in he the, and uh, who cue ball, his drummer. Oh yeah. Okay. They call him cue ball. I think his name's Gary or something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he's got as many them stories as bear does, but we just started talking and I had, uh, actually David Bellamy from the Bellamy brothers. We had written some songs together, and he said, hey, have you ever met Bobby Bear? was talking about him one day, and I said, no, I haven't. Yeah. He said, well, if you ever do, you need to tell him uh, hello from us. And he said, he, he's somebody you need to meet, you know, and maybe, That's maybe true. write some with. So That's true. We exchanged numbers that day at that show, and uh, I called him one morning, and I said, I, it was a while after that, and I didn't know if he'd remember who I was or not. But I said, "Man, I I didn't wake you up, did I?" He said, oh, "Yeah." <laughs> I said, "Shit." <laughs> I said, uh, what, what, time, "What time was it?" <laughs> Ten thirty. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I said, "Man, I'm sorry." I didn't. He's like, "Oh, that's that's all right. What you got?" <laughs> and we you know had, what he? he you else. know the only thing he got up early for fishing oh yeah without a doubt man he loved fish he's got all jerry reed's old and them tournaments they did together yeah uh, you know he's got all them trophies and all oh, really all, all reed's old fishing rods in his garage sitting there it's oh amazing. good great amazing that's yeah. amazing yeah we, you know little jimmy dickens and a bunch of them used to fish you know yeah we uh, uh we wrote a song uh, called "What Am I Doing Down Here in Miami," and it was an idea <laughs> that he had. And we wrote a couple of songs, really. Yeah. And, and he said, "Man, I'm gonna record that. If I do another album, I'm gonna record that. I'm still waiting." So <laughs> I, I ain't talked to him in a while, but uh, I mean, you know what? I need to, to go him. see him, man. I, I I know his health is in, in bad shape, and. Uh, I did speak to Jenny the past week or two, but uh, they're they're great people, boy. I tell you, he he crossed a lot of paths through the years and helped a lot of people. Yeah, sure did. He sure helped me. And uh, you know, once you got to Nashville, how how did how did you like the scene back there in the seventies in the Whalen era and the Willie? thing and then you know the nashville scene how did that all mesh together for you you know it was amazing andrew it really was a it was a golden era yeah and um it's a it's an era that'll never never happen again quite the same way but you know i don't uh i don't hold any grudges against the evolution of country music because that's just the way it's always been. It's always evolved. And uh, I don't, I, I try to be very supportive of the young folks. There There are some talented folks out there. I mean, you know, I, I do belong to the old school. I have to admit that. But And I think there was some precision writing going on back in those days that, that we'll never see again. I mean, it's... Uh, there were some just unbelievable writers back in those days. I mean, uh, I was going to try to name a few, but, but my, my, my memory slipped me. But, but you know who they were. But they, uh, oh yeah, I tell you, I learned I learned from the best, really. Just listening on the radio, you know, Mickey Dewberry was a big influence on me, mm. and and uh, great great melody writer, and. Um, Whitey Schaefer, mm-hmm. uh, Curly Putman. Of course, mm-hmm. Curly is from Huntsville. Yeah. Or 
are up in the mountains over there. Yeah. And uh, I told him one time that uh, has Jim McBride ever been on your show? No, but he was the first person I ever co-wrote a song with. Oh, really? He was. I'll tell you what, man. Jim taught me how to dig for lyrics. Yeah. He, he and I used to uh, write down there in Monrovia, and we wrote our first hit song together down there. It's called Goodbye Time. Oh, yeah. Oh, come And uh, you got to get you got to get Jim on your show, man. He's a good guy. Yeah, I need to. Uh, He's man. That rascal went on to make history. I, I pretty much had to beg him to leave the post office to come to Nashville, man. He, he had those benefits and stuff and he had a family and you could understand why it'd be so hard for him to cut loose of that. But, but he finally made it and man, the rest is history. Yeah. But, uh, I forget what I was going to say when I first mentioned his name, but, we got him coming up here. He's going to do the Hooper End show here at the local radio station and do a book signing at our bookstore over here. But um, anyhow, uh, yeah, Jim, Bobby always thought Jim should have recorded himself. You know, he had a good baritone voice. Yeah. And uh, so we go way back. <laughs> well, what, you know, after you got to Nashville, how long did it take you to see something happen? Maybe not a song recorded, but just some sort of inkling that you're well, in the right you know, place. You know, I, it wasn't very long, but I'll tell you why. Bobby Bear was, you know, he, he was producing a guy named Wynn Stewart. Oh, yes. Great singer out of Texas. Well, uh, he he recorded one of my songs on Win called "It's Raining in Seattle," mm-hmm. and uh, and man, we were enjoying the ride up the charts. My first ever. It got to forty four, but then Jerry Bradley, who used to run RCA, he tried to contact Win Stewart on the road, and Win was having trouble drinking back in those days, and he ended up not returning Jerry's call. So Jerry ended up dropping him from the label, man. And of course, when that happened, it killed our records, you know? Yeah. But uh, I think I, I probably had that happen probably in, within a couple of years or three. But then it was kind of dormant for a good while after that. But really at Bobby's office, I did a lot of woodshedding, man. I, I, I did a lot of learning and pretty much I'd have to say most, most of, mostly taught myself how to write. So it took me, it took me uh, longer in, in some respects, but, uh, and then, then after things started happening, I started doing a lot of, writing with other writers and it increased my volume and it increased my variety of songs too. And so I kind of leaned on that a good bit and it was helped me be very uh, prolific more so than I would have been by myself. But, uh, but I'm, I'm kind of bouncing all over the place here, but That's all it, right. it took a few years, you know, but, they call it a 10 year town. Yeah. But uh, that's only if it doesn't, that's only if it takes 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but sometimes it happens a little sooner for some people. Yeah. But it, it depends on your connections and stuff like that. Well, how, how did goodbye time come about? Okay, goodbye time. No, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Did I say that was my first? Oh, goodbye time. Uh, the mine and Jim song was a bridge that just won't burn. Okay, yeah, that was the first. Goodbye time came much later. James Dean Hicks and I wrote that. Okay, and uh, so did I confuse you on that? What's that? I didn't know. 
Well, I, you just mentioned goodbye time, but I think he was talking about a bridge yeah. just won't burn. Yeah, 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 that's right. But but it started a long relationship with Conway Twitty. Yeah. He and of course they called him the song's best friend. Yeah. Conway was also a great song man. And uh I'll tell you how smart he was. He was also a great businessman. And uh for a few years he had his own publishing company. And uh he got word that the writers in town was concerned about him recording his own songs that he was publishing. Yeah. And he, he ended up selling that company for that reason. Really? He said, I didn't, he didn't want to cut off his songs that were coming from songwriters. So wow. he knew it was his lifeline, man. Wow. That was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. He had a co-deal with tree publishing back in those days. I believe it was. And he sold it. He, he put a stop to that rumor. Didn't know that. And, uh, I love that story. And, uh, Mm. But man, he, he was a fascinating man. He, I'll tell you a funny story about him. Uh, he used to refer to himself in third person when he was having his board meetings. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, it'd be just like he, he's sitting out there in the middle of the board, the table, you know, Yeah. and, and somebody would bring up an idea or something, you know, and Conway would say, I don't think Conway would like that. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> and buddy, if Conway didn't like it, it wasn't going to fly. <laughs> but he, he was really a shrewd, shrewd business operator. And, uh, but he used to call me when he was getting ready to do an album. Want to know if I had anything new he hadn't heard. And if I did, I'd take it to him. But if I didn't, I'd take him some I had already taken. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> sometimes that worked, too. <laughs> That's funny right there. Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, it, it must have been uh, you during the, God, I mean, especially the 80s. It looks like it was just one after another for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. man. I, at one time, I had uh, I had three in the top five, and I, I used to study those charts like a scientist. I'm telling you, I could predict I could predict activity on songs and things like that just because I I don't know I just kind of had a feel for it. But I remember when I had three in the top five, I was hoping number two would would drop so number three could go up, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it, I, it was a good problem to have, <laughs> man. I mean, uh, you know, Southern rains by Mel Tillis in 1981 yeah. was a number one, wasn't it? Yeah. That was my first. That was the first one. How did that? Yeah. Was that a, did you write that yourself or was that a co-write? Yeah. Wow. No, I wrote that myself um, and I'll tell you, Andrew, I, when I wrote that song, I was basically, uh, I was basically uh, sharing my love for the South. Yeah, that that song is somewhat bi- autobiographical, and at that time, that was before I kind of developed as a what you what you'd call a professional writer. So I was I was just writing it for the song, man. I didn't have any clue that it, it could be a hit. And, uh, but I think it was so real that, uh, yeah. they really, people were really loving it. And, uh, but I'll tell you something that happened. So I used to sing my own demos and, uh, and we cut the good demos, man. I, I have to admit. And, uh, we had a heck of a demo on that song. And when I heard Mel Tillis's cut on it, uh, I was I was honestly disappointed because it seemed so stiff to me. <laughs> it really did, man. Yeah. And uh, I but but I learned my lesson. I, I learned a lesson from that. 
that a stiff song can go to number one. (laughs) (laughs) And um, the good thing about that, they had never heard our demo, so they didn't know how how good it could be. (laughs) But uh, that's uh... yeah, Jimmy Jimmy Bowen produced that, and actually, Jimmy coming to town was a good thing for me because some for some reason. He was hearing some of my songs when I didn't even realize he was hearing them. And uh, he kind of got into my writing. So that's how I ended up with that cut on Mel Tillis. Isn't it ironic that you said you're just writing it for the song? Exactly. It's called a professional. And that's your first number one. Yes. You know, because it was just, it was for the love of the song and it resonated with people. You know? Absolutely. And and I I'm glad you brought that up because let me tell you, I I kind of I kind of learned how to I learned more and more and more how to be commercial, okay? Yeah. But then I had to come back. I had to come back in my mind to where I wrote I wrote for the song's sake. And that's when my stuff really started resonating. Um I, I was a real skillful uh, writer and became quite skillful at it. And, and actually probably was one of the better, better editors in town when it came to songs. And mm-hmm. I taught a lot of writers that I signed through the years from, and, and I would edit their songs, you know, to kind of help them get them better. Yeah. And so, um, um, but what I wanted to emphasize is what you mentioned already is as much as possible when I'm writing, the song is the boss, the song rules the roost. And, and I don't, I don't uh, sacrifice the song for uh, what would you call it? Tricky lyric and stuff like that. I found out that kind of stuff has to be, in context, yeah, it it has to be real, man. Like uh, used to, you know, all of us writers like cliches and stuff like that. But cl- cliches are only good when you use them naturally. Sure, you don't just stick a cliche in the song; it takes over the song. Yeah, it in- it interrupts the song, and uh, but when you can do it naturally, just like a conversation. Yeah. That makes your song that makes your song come alive. Makes it more powerful. Same thing with uh, same thing with uh, tangible lyrics. That's something else I had to learn. I used to write, write much more cerebral kind of lyric, and I had to learn that they, people need to feel like they can touch it, yeah. smell it, and watch it move, see it, stuff like that. You know, and um, but uh, I'll tell you one of the I tell you one of the best things I ever learned about songwriting. A guy named Rich Alves used to pitch songs for us at Tom Collins Music. Rich, probably other than myself, he, he probably pitched more songs of mine and got them cut because I used to love to do that too, you know. But he told me one time. See, I used to really love to write a song, what I call leak proof. I wrote it really tight, lyric wise. Mm-hmm. And he told me this one time. He said, he said, you know, sometimes the magic is in the flaw factor. Mm-hmm. And man, that blew my mind. Well, and it changed my writing from that from that day on. That's powerful. Because I was writing I was writing stuff so tight that it, it would put people to sleep because it it's that bump in the road, man. It's that rock in the road that that gets people people's tension back. Yeah, you know, it's that it's that kind of flaw that it could be a melody flaw or it can be a lyric flaw. <laughs> Just a lot of tricks to it. Well, I mean, man, that and is... uh, I think I think that'll really be helpful to your listeners because uh, it, it sure helped me. You know, I feel that's such a good, a good thing to keep in mind. 
I feel yeah. the exact same way about recordings. You know, I miss flaws in the recordings. I don't like everything to sound perfect. That is exactly right. It takes that away exactly the heartbeat of the song if there's no. Well, well, I tell you, man, it, it, uh, what is that word? Uh, forget the word. Oh, it makes it sterile. Yeah. It makes it sterile. It does. It's, oh man, you, you got to have a loose production. You yeah. got to loosen it up. I don't care if you're doing digital or what. You better get some flaws in there. Yeah, you better loosen it, rascal up. I wish that's time. why I, I don't like. Uh, I don't really like drum machines for that reason. I like, I like real drums. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I, there are ways to do that kind of stuff. But I tell you, I tell you, the guy who did the most with digital was uh, Tony Brown. Oh, yeah. Tony. Yeah. Tony would mix and uh, what do you call it? Analog? analog. He would mix it analog. He'd cut it digital and mix it analog. And uh, so he he kind of had the the best of both worlds, about as well as anybody ever did production wise. I wonder why he wanted to do that when when it was a world of just digital. You know, everything had just went well to- because he he was. He was brilliant, man. He was he was a yeah. genius at what he was doing, and he realized exactly what you and I are talking about. Yeah, that's it's it's just that simple. He knew he knew he had to get that he had to get that flaw factor in it. He may have called it something else, but that's what it was. Hey, you know, it, it makes it real. It does, and and it's amazing to me all these producers: Tony Brown, Jimmy Bowen, you know, even Barry Beckett and stuff like that. You can, I can, I can hear a song on the radio or on the record and you can almost not only pick out, you know, because the vocal, the, the, the vocalists were so, they were such stylists. They were just, you know, you already knew when it came on, who it was going to be. Nobody exactly. sounded the same. I can almost pick out who produced it because they're, oh, well, exactly. The, the production. How, sounds. how. How easy was it to pick out Jerry Kennedy? Remember? Oh yeah, Jerry I mean, Kennedy and Barry Beckett. When you mentioned him, man, he he was one of my heroes. He he is the most um, soulful white man I've ever met, and he really really added to Nashville when he came up here. Yeah, he. Uh, I just can't say enough good things about Barry Beckett, man. He, he was amazing. He actually tried to, he, he thought about recording me one time. And so we were in the studio. He actually funded a, a oh. session on me and we became really good friends. Whatever happened to that? Well, uh, you know, I, I think the writing kind of took off and I, I didn't really have the time to devote to it. Plus, um, I don't guess we got a bite on the, yeah. whatever we did, you know, so yeah. it, um, but boy, I, I tell you what, I, I wanted to record. So what I did, I said, I need some muscle shows and I need some country. Yeah. So I went to Barry Beckett. I said, I, I would love for you to produce me, man. And, uh, it, isn't that a great thought to think about the combination of that? Yeah. Sure and is. see, that was that's before Barry ever came to Nashville. Yeah, I, I kind of was helpful with him moving up here. I mean, uh, but he he's something, man. I'm telling you, all those guys in most shows, I, I respect them all so much. Oh yeah, the- and see, I tell you what, the the uh, our heroes, um, well, uh, shucks. Uh, the two great writers, there's other writers, but I'm trying to think. Oh, Penn, uh, Dan Penn, Spooner Oldham. Oh, yeah. Golly, Pete, man. I used to, I used to just love their records. I was just a few cotton fields across from them, you know, and I couldn't believe it, Andrew. I got a, a creator's award and was considered a contemporary of those guys. And man, I thought that was unbelievable. That's gotta be, that's I just gotta couldn't be. believe it. Yeah. I, I, I really couldn't believe it. it. It was one of the most 
honored, honorable things that ever happened to me, really. Mm. Because I held them in such high esteem. Yeah. And still do. You know, it's talking about Martin Armour. Spooner Oldham is Mark's cousin. Yeah, yeah. I find, I kind of knew that. And also Philip White. Philip White is kin to Spooner, too. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he is. And uh, if you don't believe it, just ask him. <laughs> He's uh, Philip's also humble. Just if you don't believe it, ask him. <laughs> now that's a joke. <laughs> uh, did you like? You know, we kind of just jump around wherever. Just to, you know, whatever comes up is kind of yeah. the kind of the flow. Yeah, but man, that's did, fine. Did you uh, want to be? a singer did you want to be an artist or was the writing just oh good oh no yeah man i, I definitely got into business to be the next elvis i really did wow. that that's overstating it but i did want to be a singer see um yeah i backed into the writing but i'll tell you a funny story it sounds about as country as you can get but it's true my daddy traded a pickup truck for an old acoustic piano years ago and uh i love that me and uh my sister and one of my brothers who just passed away unfortunately on monday michael oh i'm sorry we, we all thank you he was he was my best friend and uh mm. my most forgiving song critic <laughs> and uh we uh but we learned how to play by ear on that piano and we still got it too. It it may it may become in a display up here at the Harpeth Hotel eventually. We're talking about that. Which is where you're at now, the Harpeth yeah, Hotel. Yeah, that's I actually live here. Yeah. That's that's some more place. Yeah. Oh, by the way, um Andrew, speaking of recording. See, that's the one dr music related dream of mine, the only one that hasn't come true. And so I'm planning on cutting an album of, of my songs. Good. And Larry Rogers is going to co produce it with me. And um, I think we're going to do it live in an old country store. Oh, yeah. Uh, over down the road here. I can't think of the name of it. It's called the Red House, Red, the Red Store or something like that. But uh, I'm hoping to do that. We're going to cut it live uh, as uh, soon as we can. That'd be great. You need that. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah man, I, I would love to do that. It'd be, I mean, I don't have any illusions of, you know, making a lot of money on it, but what yeah. I'd like to do, I'd like to have it for people. Yeah. And it'd be nice to make enough to pay for it, but other than that, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> right. Oh. Uh. I mean, we, we, you know, we could, we could literally spend all day talking about all these songs you had recorded. I mean, Life's Highway, Steve Warner is another one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Richard Lee, Richard Lee and I wrote that song and uh, Richard wrote my favorite line in the song. He said, uh, let me see, here's hoping uh, you never go astray on Life's Highway. I love that line. Yeah. That's a good and one. I hate to give I hate to give him credit yeah, in a way a <laughs> I do, but, <laughs> but I've got to man. He get he he came on when he got it that it made the rest of the song work to me. Um, you know, and you know, a lot of a lot of people love that melody on that thing, man, and and it it's pretty country, pretty straight ahead country. Yeah, it really is. But but uh, and of course. I was a big fan of Steve Warner and uh, ended up getting to write with Steve. And, um, you know, he was known in the industry as, as the best guy in town. And Loretta Lynn was the best woman in town. You know, people just loved it. Yeah, I hated but, uh, I hated that we lost Loretta. I never got to meet oh, I know. My God, what a. I know. What a groundbreaking human oh, being that man. she was man i'm telling you and i just love the way she remained yeah i heard the best quote the other day on the 60 minutes about loretta 
And they said, um, she may be ignorant, but she's not dumb. <laughs> I love that. I just love that, man. She was, she was brilliant in her own way, man. Oh, she was just brilliant. And she had, she was brave. She was, yes. Super, nobody was doing what she was doing, putting that out. There. No, man. She, she was fighting the women liberation thing and did just had it in people's faces and they didn't even realize it. They were eating it up. And just and Jack quite talked about that. You know, mm -hmm. that she, she was probably man. Nobody was more effective in the, in the movement really than Loretta's songs. Yeah. And all she was doing was telling the truth, man. Yeah. And, um, uh, I, I just have so much respect for her. I, don't, I just can't, can't say enough. I'm telling you. Did you get to know her? I didn't, man. I wish I could say I did. Mm. I feel like I did know her, but, uh, I'll tell you somebody else that's brilliant. I mean, she's just brilliant. probably the smartest artist that ever came through Nashville is Dolly. Oh, absolutely. Dolly. Dolly is a brilliant, brilliant woman. Yes. She, 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 she kind of, I hate to say it with this word, but she manipulated yeah. the boy system. She did as good as it could be manipulated. I agree. 100%. I mean, she came, she came out from under a, a very stern kind of a situation with Porter Yeah, and did it in the most, uh, loving way you can, you know, she wrote the song, yeah, uh, to him, yeah, it became the monster hit on, on Whitney and, and Dolly, mm -hmm. everybody else. She wrote that to Porter, yeah, when she left him. And uh, but man, she went from there to just one a major thing after the other, and she has not stopped, she has not stopped. Uh, work in the music business just like a, a, a uh, sculptor works a, a sculptor. That's right. And she did it. She had it do exactly what she wanted to do, man. I'm telling you. That don't just come yeah. from everybody. I mean, she's brilliant. She really is brilliant. And I, I love the stuff with like with Johnny Carson, you know, with her. Oh yeah. Thing. I mean, she just didn't miss a beat just so quick. They, I know. they wouldn't even know what to say, you know, I to know her. It, because she, she's so she just, set that up. I was watching that when that happened. That I'm is, glad you mentioned it. I think I thought it was amazing. It really. I mean, she's I mean, she'd take she'd take uh things certainly a couple of things and yeah. then just make a promotion out of exactly. it. But she knew, she, she knew what she was doing. Yeah. Yeah. And she said somewhere before, you know, I'm glad people think I'm the dumb blonde because then I can shock yeah. them more, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. and that's the He'd truth. Sneak. She could sneak right up on the blind side. Yeah. Right? Yeah. She does. And she would rule the ruse for it's over with. Yeah. She's, yeah. I love Dolly. She's truly one of a kind and, you know, just about everybody loves her, no matter where you're from, what kind of me, even if you don't like country music, you, you love oh, I know, man. household. Names. Well, she, you know, she, she and cash, they were, they're bigger than country music. Yeah. I mean, Johnny cash is worldwide. Yeah. Dolly's worldwide. And, um, Bobby bear told me something one time. He said, you know why Johnny cash last like he has he said just when you think you've got him figured out he changes him. i mean you know, and there's a lot of truth to that boy yeah, but what it was was dimensions in, in yeah. johnny you mean even i mean you know just even to the last of his life man he used that to his benefit yeah he did and and the young people were eating it up and people don't realize, I mean, they, I heard something the other day. I just loved it. It's a couple of young people talking. They said, you know, when we get among our peers, we, 
we kind of act like we like what they like. But when we get home, we look up things like Johnny Cash, Waylon, Merle Haggard. I mean, that's what's going on in music, man. They're, they're looking for reality. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I think, I think the young people are, are beginning to come around and needing a little more meat. I think so too. And that's, that's the only hope we have of, of stuff getting much better. Yeah. I Be- think so. Because, you know, we went through an era where it was about the beat. It was about the melody. Uh, you know, all the stuff that, yeah, that kind of mess it up for us, <laughs> for some of us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, there's a lot of independent guys out there right now, like, uh, Cody Jinx, you know, out of Texas, yep. man, he I just, know, man, he just, he's headlining rodeo Houston headlining. Oh man. That's and, amazing. And he sold out, I think two nights in a row at red rocks, you know, and that is amazing, man. I love that. And, and no level, well, no Nashville, you know, he's just, it's a different time now. And yeah. He's got he's got yeah. a good team that he pays now. I mean, that's you know, that's really yeah. what it takes when you get yeah. that momentum. Exactly. I guarantee he's got his own promotion people too. Yes, he does. Sure does. And and you know what? I tell you what happened. The, the um, when country music started making a lot of money, it things started really changing. And I'll tell you. The greed became more evident. Yeah. You know, there's always been an amount of greed in any kind of thing that makes money. Sure. But but it became more uh, in the open. I mean, people were doing things, you know, they called it good business. But what it was, was it was theft. Yeah. And, and what they've done, they forced people to become independent. And then the independents are coming with the stuff that we need to make it live again. Yeah. That's very so, good point. So it's doing its own bidding, you know? Yeah. Oh. And 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 all along the blame labels were too darn greedy to be smart enough to listen to people who knew. Yeah. Which which were the creative people. Uh, yeah. And I might have been producers, might have been writers, may have been artists. But, you know, Waylon and Willie taught them some lessons, you know? Oh, did they ever? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I heard a quote one time or read it or something that Waylon said about Willie that said, "The I think the most outlaw thing about Willie Nelson is double parking out here in front of a building or something. <laughs> <laughs> that just cracked me up. <laughs> that sounds just exactly like Waylon. Man. You know, they, they were like two little brothers. <laughs> they, they would get mad at each other and stay mad for three months. <laughs> then they'd get back together and do an album <laughs> yeah. and, and forget all about what made them mad at each other. It's yeah. so funny, man. And they're changing the business and the world without even knowing it just doing yeah they, they they didn't even care they just they just did their thing yeah and you know you know who could have run for president with the indian the american indian it was that waylon they loved waylon jennings mm. he, he could go on those res- reservations and they would just flock to him boy i mean and uh waylon was one of he was the, one of the best things that ever happened to me in the music business because he was the one that remained bigger than life after I got to know him. And, uh, you know, I had the privilege of writing yeah. the album with him about his life, you know, and man, what did we have some fun? I'm telling you, he and, had the best sense of humor. And how in the hell did you get him to write with you? That's what I like <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's a very good question. I'll tell you what happened. He called our office. I was with Tom Collins at the time and uh, wanted to know if I'd meet with him. And uh, just like, who wouldn't, you know? My God, yeah. I mean. <laughs> so I went down to his office and I took my brother in law with me and I took my dad in law with me so my dad in law could meet him. So my brother in law could take some pictures. 
And uh, so anyhow, I go down there and, and uh, he, he talks to me. And unbeknownst to me, he'd been listening to some of my demos and loved the way I phrased songs. Wow. He really loved the way I phrased songs. And uh, he uh, had actually cut a couple of things, I believe it was, two or three things. So he said, he said, Hoss, I'm, I'm wanting to write an album about my life before somebody puts it in the book and gets it wrong. <laughs> and, uh, he said, and I'd love for you to write it with me. And, of course, my I God. just just floored me, man, just floored me. And so he said that was on in December of the year before we did it. And uh, he said, I'll call you after the holidays and we'll get back together. And, of course, I left after that incredible meeting thinking, well, I may never hear from him again. But, buddy, this has been amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, but sure enough, just as he, uh, he always, he always, um, you could depend on his word. He, he, he called me after the, uh, first of the year there and, uh, I got with him again and we started mapping out what we we're going to do. And I was concerned a little bit about how we'd handle the drug days yeah. just because of my own moral thoughts about things like that. And uh, and in the meantime, you got to realize Tom Collins is one of the biz- best businessmen that ever hit Music Row, and Tom was all about the buck. Boy, he wanted, uh, he wanted all he could get, and and uh, he wanted hundred percent of anything he could get. You know? uh-huh, yeah. But anyhow, I was telling I was telling Tom about my reservation about how we were going to handle the drug days when we wrote about the album, wrote the album. And uh, Tom said, don't, don't worry, Roger. We'll, we'll figure it out, man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it was so funny to me. He thought I was going to blow the whole deal. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but I talked to Waylon about it. He said, he said, I'll tell you what, Hoss, we won't put out anything that we aren't both happy about. Wow. And he never backed down from that. And so we, uh, that song on the album, it says, uh, let me see. Uh, Rough and rowdy uh, days. Well, that, that was one thing. It was another song. It's called, uh, uh, golly, I can't think of the name of it. Uh, but it was talking about drugs. It was like, uh, mm, man, I hate I can't think of that song. But any, it's uh we we found ways to do it, you know, creatively. Yeah. And uh, and I learned a lot about Waylon. He'd come in with uh, chunks of thought, and I'd I'd start kind of laying it out in lines. And I'll tell you a real funny thing that happened. Um, we had this one one little word thing in a in a lyric we were working on, and we were kind of arguing about it a little bit, you know. And I, I would argue with him just to just to uh, just for the fun of it, you know. And so so I thought one day I was just gonna have some fun with it. And uh so the day after we were talking about that line, we came in. Of course, first thing he wanted to know is who's going to get the Browns burgers. Browns burgers was a little hamburger place over on uh, you know, close to Music Road. And he loved those hamburgers. He he would sit, he would sit at the catch, kitchen table, and uh, gather all the staff around and tell his war stories about him and Willie and all that kind of stuff. Wow. I'm telling you, people were eating it up. Boy. What a guy! Then we then we'd get in the then we'd get in my little closet of an office I had at Tom Collins. So anyhow, back to the story. I, I told Waylon about that line. I said, Waylon, I think we need to use those. I need. I think we need to use that line, man. I knew it was going to make him mad. You know? He said, he said, I'll tell you what you do, Hoss. You take that line, you write it down on a little piece of paper, and you roll that so and so up. And then a couple of days, you put it in your pocket. In a couple of days, you throw it away. <laughs> and I laughed and died laughing. I couldn't. I couldn't hold it, man. 
<laughs> it just tickled me to death. I'd, I'd rather make him laugh as anything. I, I'll tell you one more story. I don't want to wear you out on it, but no, say what you want. When I first, when I first uh, got was getting to know him, he invited my wife and I over to his house for the holidays. Over to his and Jesse's house over in Brentwood. What they call Southern well, Comfort. Sitting- Huh? The Southern Comfort House with the big oh, gate. Yeah, out. probably, yeah. probably, yeah, yeah. But uh, w- we were sitting in this house. In comes Tonti Hall and his wife, Chet Atkins and his wife, Marty Stewart, Connie, Connie uh, Smith. Smith. Uh, all these people, man. And I'm, I'm thinking, what in the heck are we doing here? Well. Make a long story short, after everybody went home, after we all had a dinner and all that kind of stuff, well, Jesse fell asleep on the sofa, and uh, Kitty and I were sitting there, and Waylon was reading cowboy poems from a book that he had gotten from a poet. He was reading us poems from this book, man. Can you imagine? Mm. It was so surreal. And I wasn't about to go to sleep. <laughs> I said, I'm going to remember this the rest of my life. Uh, yeah. But he ended up giving me that poem, that uh, book. Oh. And, uh, but he was a, he was a wonderful, wonderful guy. I mean, he, he had the biggest heart other than my brother, Michael. He had the biggest heart of anybody I've ever known. And people thought he was rough and rowdy, and he was crusty, you know, and he was hard headed. And he, I tell you what, if he believed it's true, you might as well just forget about it. That's it's going to be his way or no way. Yeah. And uh, that's it. That's exactly the way he dealt with um, the music industry. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I mean, when Willie turned in, I believe it was the. Uh, let's see the redhead is stranger album yeah Demo, i believe basically. that was the album yeah he was in that meeting and man he got mad he really got angry that the people didn't understand the record label didn't understand that album and basically walked out of the out of the meeting anyhow he was very instrumental in that that getting out and uh of course, the rest is history. I guess it was the first million seller. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was uh, the Outlaw album. Yeah. May have been the first million was, yeah. seller. Yeah, I yeah. think that was it. But, uh, but they proved their point, man. They did. I'm telling you, it's. Uh, and you know, you're talking about that redheaded stranger record. Yeah, I mean, first of all, if if anybody's not ever heard that record from beginning to end. You yeah. got to do that because it's, it's, it's a concept album and. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's that, right. At that time, I'm, you listen to that whole thing and it's like, what genius of Willie Nelson to have in know. He was such a visionary. I mean, he, not, he knew exactly laid out to a T how he wanted that done. And he said, this is, this is it. This is how it's going to be. Yeah. And. If y'all don't yeah, like yeah. it, then yeah, you know, I'm not re-recording them. You know, I'm not going to yeah. re-record it and add. Exactly, exactly. Amazing album. Yeah, I'll tell you what, man. He had a, he did have a vision. I think, I think creatively, he saw things that nobody else was seeing. Yeah. I mean, you know, you and I know he wrote, he wrote some of the best songs that ever were. Yeah. Uh, before all that started happening, I mean, he was, Oh yeah. He was kind of a joke as an artist really early on. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, I bet you heard this story, you know, there was a time when Willie sold one of those monster songs of his for just a little bit of money. I don't know what it was, but. Hello uh, walls. I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, somebody's told him, he said, Willie, that was a great song, man. Why in, the, why in the world did you do that? He said that was a good meal too. I had. <laughs> yeah. He was so he sold it to eat. I mean, 
I got to tell you one more funny story about somebody different. Yeah. You remember Webb Pierce? Yeah. Remember Webb Pierce? Okay. Webb was a court big hit maker back in the in his day, and to kind of a commentary on uh, early days in Nashville. Somebody pitched him a song one day, <laughs> and uh, Webb said, "I like it. I'll put your name on it, buddy." <laughs> He's talking to the songwriter. <laughs> That's just how fragrant, fragrant he was. Flagrant he was, whatever. Uh, next thing, next thing I do, I, I see, I see his car sitting on the square in Athens, with horns on the front and silver dollars all over the dash. <laughs> so he was a true hillbilly country star, boy. Oh yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, had had some big records. What, what did you think of uh, Alabama when they come to town? Because I know they were kind of the, the you know, the anti-establishment. They were kind of rock and rollers, really. Yeah. Wore blue jeans well, and long uh, hair. And... Yeah. Well, I, I'm kind of, I'm pretty easily accepting of people because I know um, people, people bring gifts and they're wrapped in different packages, you know? Uh-huh. All different so sizes. So I thought, I, thought uh, I was just very curious about them because we, we immediately started hearing about them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, of course, Harold Shedd being interested in them was no small thing. Yeah. Because Harold had, uh, had some success with other things. And uh, so, you know what? It, it's a... It's a good question you're asking because specifically, I don't remember. I, I think I would have just been real curious about them because anything new, you want to you wanna have your mind open because you never know where the next thing's coming from. Right. And so that would have been my attitude about it. And then, and then when they started cutting my songs, I thought they were the greatest things that ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> No, where have you been was, all my life? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I, that reminds me of a funny story. You, you know Mark Allen Springer. I, I know the name, but I've never met. Okay, him. he wrote he wrote two sparrows in a hurricane. Yeah. And, oh yeah. And that was the first that was the first song I ever published a hundred percent of. Oh, that's a great uh, song. But but we kid we kid Mark about that because. Mark once told us that there's this new artist on the scene. He said he can't sing his way out of a paper bag, man. Well, it was he's talking about Kenny Chesney. Uh-huh. <laughs> Kenny started cutting Mark's song. <laughs> Mark told us one day he may be one of the best singers ever here at the staff. <laughs> and I, I pulled that on him at a at a Songwriter show one night, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, another trick I pulled on him too, you know, he was the first writer I signed and uh, somebody was asking him about Two Sparrows and Hurricane after it became a big hit. And uh, I think they said something like, Mark, didn't you write that song by yourself? And and before he could say, yeah, I, I interrupted, I said, yeah, it took me and Mark about three weeks for him to write that by himself. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mark turned red, man. You'd have to know his sense of humor. He didn't think that was funny at all. <laughs> but I corrected him. He's a heck of a writer. Heck of a writer. He, was, he was one of the first writers that I signed that uh, he was real good about getting emotion into songs. And uh, if you've never heard this song of his called uh, I Was There, That's Why I'm Here, you got to hear it. You got to hear it. Look it up. I think I have heard that. That's Kenny Chastney. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah man. It, it's supposed to have been a single, but it never did come out as a single. But, man, I'm telling you, that's one of the best songs in town right there. Uh, so you had your own you eventually had your own publishing company that you started. Yeah, I had 
I had it for about 20 years. Yeah. And he's the first one you signed to that publishing. Yeah. Company. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, of course, my claim to fame, among other things, was Luke Bryan. I had Luke for six years, taught him everything he knows. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take that back. <laughs> I, did, uh, I did teach him a lot about writing. i tell you, man, I, Andrew, I'll tell you, I would tell him this at the base. In fact, I told him. I was going to use some of those early songs to bribe him one of these days because I knew it was going to be a big success. But buddy, he wrote, he brought me some songs that would, whew, they were bad. They were bad. <laughs> but he, he went on to learn to write and uh, I'm proud of him. I'm really proud of him. He's, oh. he's a good guy. You know, he's, he's, he's part of the bros, but he's the leader, I guess. But uh, he, 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 uh, found a way to be successful good more power to him you know uh, going back to alabama southern yeah. star i've always loved that song southern star and i feel like that's one that people kind of forget about sort of but I oh heard... yeah that's true man that's true that i think um i was thrilled to death to get that cut really i really was because i loved what we were trying to say we were trying to be a little more edgy with them. Yeah. And, um, I think, I think we may have kind of landed in the ditch on that because we were kind of in between country and trying to be maybe a little more hip than we were, than we had the ability, ability to do. Mm. But I really like, I really like that song a lot too. And I appreciate you saying that. And I was going to say, too, I heard David Allen Coe had a version of that song. I heard that on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. You know what? That reminds me. I need to look that up. I want, I want to hear what he did to it. I'll, uh, I'll send it to you. Oh, do, man. I'll Please do. Uh, I never I even you, knew that he recorded it, but I found it on YouTube one day. Oh, that's great, man. Yeah, please do send it. I'd love to hear that. Um I'll tell you something that happened with Alabama that it was a, it was a story that, that kind of ended well, but kind of started off kind of strange. But years ago, another song of mine that they recorded was Ozark Mountain Jubilee. And um, now anybody that knows me knows how much respect I have for Randy and the guys. They've been so good to me, but I'm telling you what they, they tried to make a love song out of Ozark Mountain Jubilee, which the Oak Ridge Boys finally cut out, put it out, put it out. But anyhow, that song, when I heard the take on it, it really, really just disappointed me to no end because it just really wasn't working, man. It, they were trying to make it more commercial, I guess, by making a love song out of it. And, uh, and I was so disappointed here's what I was close to doing. I mean, I, the, this was a day when I was, I needed the money. I really needed the money bad, but I was almost ready to walk across the street and tell Harold Shedd to please not put that song out mm. because it was just that bad to me. And it just, it really hurt me because that song meant a lot to me. Mm. And uh, of course, there was a combination of things going on. I was young and stupid, at least uh, younger and less less intelligent. I'll put it that way. <laughs> but but my the integrity of that song meant more to me than than I could afford, honestly. But uh, but the thing about it, as time as as things turned out, they never did release it, and I was so so glad that they didn't. Mm. But uh, but when they start going back in the can, who knows? It may come out in the future. But uh, possible, I'll live with it <laughs> if they do. Yeah, I was thinking the but, whole time when you were saying that. I don't remember ever hearing them record that. No, no, it never did why. come out. Never did come out. No, and uh, but man, their version is golly, it's mm. it's unbelievable. You'll you'll hear it one of these days, maybe. <laughs> um, maybe not i don't know 
but well, uh, but they were good to me, man. They really were good to me. We, uh, of course, just lost Jeff Cook. I know. And uh, man, Jeff was a he was a in, probably the sole instrumental part of my musical life for over ten Is that years right? now. Yeah. He, he introduced right? me to Merle Haggard. He introduced me to so many people. He would come. Oh, man. He would If I was doing a show 10 years ago at a little barbecue place or a Mexican restaurant, yeah. he would come in and sit and play guitar and sing, you know, just. Oh, man, that's great. He was uh, he was real special to me. and Yeah, yeah, good, good, man. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize, I just don't know a lot about guitar players, but I didn't realize – that rascal was considered a very, very good guitar player. Yeah. He was a Gibson and, uh, guitarist of the year, I think, in 2001. Was he really? Yeah. Just those licks are iconic. They're simple. Jeff's stuff oh, is yeah, very man. simple, but it's an iconic sound that he can You are with. right. You are right. I hadn't he's, thought about that. He's a, uh, but yeah, Teddy, Teddy's a good buddy and, uh, you know, just he, I feel like he's never changed. He's just who he absolutely, is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ted, actually, none of those guys, well, actually, I knew Randy and Teddy is basically who I knew. And they, they were the same today and yesterday, man. I'm telling you. And I've got to tell you something funny. I've got yeah. to tell you, Andrew. Yeah. And uh, with all due respect to Jeff, you know, you don't usually tell things like this on a deceased person, but this is so funny. I got to tell you, <laughs> he, they came in off the road one time as the story goes, Jeff calls Teddy and tells him, uh, Teddy, you got to come over here, man. And he calls his wife's name said, she found my black book. And, uh, so, so Teddy gets over there because he's all upset. And, and then Jeff tells him, said, she, she found my, my black book, Teddy, and she's going to leave me and take half of everything I got. I'm going to kill myself. Teddy said, if you kill yourself, she's going to get it all. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, I'll get back to you. <laughs> Is that a funny story or what? <laughs> Yeah, it sounds very accurate. <laughs> okay, I'm glad to hear you say that because you do him better than me. <laughs> Man, that just quick witted too. Just always had a joke. Always, no matter what, no matter how bad he's feeling, you know. Oh, uh, Jeff. Yes. Was he was he quick witted? Oh God, yeah. And you know, he hearing you talk about you know the cotton fields and everything, I'm thinking about high cotton. You know, which was another number one you had. You had, yeah. you had High Cotton, you had I'm in a Hurry, and yeah. you had Southern Star. And yeah, that's Burn Georgia Burn was an album cut. That's I feel so right. It's amazing. You know, yeah, man, it was amazing. Songs. High Cotton probably is really special to you. Yes, it is. It, it really is more autobiographical than any song I've ever had, certainly ever had released. I mean, those things happen. My, we were picking cotton, and uh, yeah, yeah, those things really happen. And Randy and Teddy, they grew up listening to the Beatles. Yeah. You know, yeah, picking cotton. Yeah. So it's special to them. You know, how did that? Like with them, they were so hot at the time. Did did would you just, you know, pitch Harold a demo or your, your or would Tom? pitch it to them well, and they would cut it or well no it. no i'll tell you i pitched i probably pitched i bet i pitched well maybe with the exception of southern star i pitched everything myself mm. and um uh, on high cotton um that ended they were being produced by two producers barry beckett and um shucks i can't think of his name um uh, shoot i can't remember his name but anyhow they both had that song and they both wanted to cut it on album and we we kind of worked out a deal somehow where one let the other one have it and that's kind of how that came about 
And uh, I've got to tell you this story. You know, I, I've only had two times in my career where I've been asked to change lyric. And that on that song, Randy was so, so uh, aware of his audience. We had a we had a line in that song where it said uh, where it talks about leaving home was the hardest crop. Let me see. Oh yeah, we had a more poetic line in in the chorus that said leaving home was the hardest crop we ever raised, mm. which was referring to the crop of children. Mm-hmm. Okay, but Randy thought it was too cerebral, and so. So he asked me to change it, and we changed it to uh, leaving home was the hardest thing we ever faced, Yeah, which was a very, very good change in that song. And it taught me something, man. Uh, when, when that happens, when an artist asks you to do something like that, the way to do it is you do it in a way that pleases them and it pleases yourself. So that way you don't lose any integrity of what you feel like belongs to the song yeah and and that i tell you man he helped us make that song better because it was much easier to grasp by the listener and he he knew his audience man he knew what to do oh absolutely yeah and uh you know the uh alan jackson don't rock the jukebox yeah what a monster that that was you know yeah man i tell you he we were, of course, he was singing demos at the time. He didn't have a label. It was he and Keith and I were together to write and hope, that, you know, that some things we would do that might be something he could record one day. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, he, he mentioned that title to us and Keith and I probably looked at each other at the same time. We knew something was there, you know, and, uh, I tell you, when we got the Rolling Stones and George Jones in the same song, I knew we had something. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm telling you, I I tell you it's what, Andrew, we basically had to stay out of the way of that song. That's how easily it was to write. Mm. And I'll tell you the honest truth. When it first came out, even after it became a hit initially, I thought it, I just thought it was a ditty, okay? And then I heard months and months later how many young people it ushered into country music. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe we had more there than we thought, you know? Yeah. But it, but it was a, a major, major hit for him and uh, obviously for us. And they, uh, they've they been repackaging it for, forever and ever and ever. And there's no telling how many millions uh, records we sold on this one song. And music videos were so big back then. Yeah, you know, yeah, that, they yeah. sold a lot of records. Just TNN and CMT playing music videos. Exactly. I miss those exactly. days, man. I that was a new days. thing, you know. Yeah, I miss those days. Uh, yeah. Of that, it was just a different time. Yeah. I wish I could have yeah. been in the industry during that time. I wish I could have. Well, you know. I, I wish you could have too, Andrew, because um, I would take nothing, man, for being here when I came. And I would, I really would not want to be coming now with all due respect to everybody. It, it, it's, it's very, very difficult. It's always been hard. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and I, now what I have to say to people, you know, you think it's hard getting in, you ought to try to get out. <laughs> when i had to sell my company all that kind of stuff then I, you know you you affect a lot of people's lives and um what uh, so what led to you having to sell the the publishing company well i didn't i wouldn't say i had to okay. but i had the opportunity to because um the the shortest way to tell the story my broker that album, I mean, for that catalog was the same broker that uh, Reservoir had looking for catalogs for their publishing company. They were just coming to town. They had a huge, huge uh, R&B, rock and roll, pop catalog. 
but they wanted to get into the country and they wanted to do it quickly and they wanted they didn't mind spending money to do it. And I tell you what, man, I, I ended up with a deal that I could have never dreamed of. Yeah. And uh, because of the timing on it. Yeah. At the at the time, I, I probably had the most desirable country catalog on town on the on the market, and uh, and they want to they wanted to make that splash, you know. They wanted to be able to talk about songs that we had, and they wanted them to be their songs, you know. So, long story short, man, it, it I was very very fortunate. One more time, man, what a. What a career! A long way yeah. from man. I'm cotton, telling you, I, long way from I, I, to country. I have been blessed, man. I have been blessed. Oh, uh, I mean, just you really, really have, you know. And you were, you were there during that time where you could make money as a songwriter, you know. Yes, just, yes. Just with an album cut. I mean, take away the number one singles or the top tens, you could make money yeah. as a songwriter. Just get. Oh, albums. absolutely, man. We were making we were making good money on album cuts. Yeah, I mean you think about it. When Feel So Right came out, after it sold two or three million, mm. I got a free ride, man. Yeah. I had Burn Georgia Burn on the back on I mean on the album. And every time it sold a million, so did I. You know. Yes. That's, and uh... yeah, those album sales they they really kept the. Songwriters rocking back in those days. I want to tell you a funny story sure. about the biggest song I ever had <clears throat> was We're in This Love Together by a jazz pop artist named Al Jarreau. And it became a worldwide hit, you know, and uh, mm. we ended up getting uh, uh, what they call a national ad campaign on that song. In fact, it was such a hit. They renewed the, the campaign. So we had two year run on the thing. And as you may be aware, those, those national ads paid a lot of money, man. And it was something kind of rare for country singer. I mean, country writers. So anyhow, when I, when I do a songwriter show, I tell people it, it was, it was from Viagra. And I said, those people tried to pay us in pills, but I told them I needed the cash. <laughs> I said, I'll take a couple of pills, but I'm not, I'm not going to get paid in pills. <laughs> oh, man. oh man. That was a good, that was a good time, man. Yeah. That's uh what a life. Like you said, you truly have been blessed and. You know, yes. I, yes. I, I really do appreciate you taking a little bit of time today to talk with us and hang out a little bit. And, hey man, I uh, feel like this is just chapter one. We need to do yeah, it again. Yeah, we can do it again. We can talk for 10 hours probably. <laughs> uh, one last man, thing I, I want to ask you. Uh, did you ever come across Hank Jr.? Because our, our viewers and me are like huge Hank fans. We always ask well, people about that. You know what? The closest I ever got to Hank was I, I knew his his dear departed manager, oh, Merle Travis. Yes, sir. Merle Kilgore, Merle Kilgore. Sorry. I had the privilege of, of introducing Merle one time. I helped him become president of the Songwriters Association. Mm. And so I introduced him. And it was the neatest introduction I've ever heard in my life. And I couldn't believe I had the opportunity to do it. I said, I want to introduce the man who was like a son to Hank Williams Sr. and like a daddy to Hank Williams Jr., wow. Merle Kilgore. Uh, <laughs> Can you imagine? Sums it up. And, sure and Merle Kilgore was a huge, bigger-than-life kind of man. Yeah. I mean, he was just an amazing man. I loved him. And uh, But now Hank, Hank Jr. cut one of my songs, uh, Kiss Mother Nature Goodbye. Yeah, it was uh, yeah. on an album. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but I never did, I never have gotten to meet him, mm. but, but, uh, closest thing I came to him was Burl and, and Barry, of course, Barry Beckett yeah. produced Hank. And, uh, I'm a big fan too, man. I'm telling you, he, he is one of the best 
country ballad singers we've ever had. Oh, yeah. Golly. Heaven can't Have you be ever found. Heard him? Huh? Heaven can't be found, you know. Oh, this. man. Just and the blues man, the blues, blues man. man. Yeah. Oh, man. He had so many I mean, albums. He, be- he, he became a true yeah. artist of his own, you know? Yeah. He was in the shadow for years, and he, he didn't like that. And I can understand that, but he really became his own, man. Goodness. He made his point. He did. And, He's uh, got the fans out there. Yeah. Uh, He's a great writer, too, you know, just. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. He, he, he writes it raw and right mm-hmm. and sings it that way, too. <laughs> That's right, man. See, you're talking about flaw factor. You look at his music. Yeah. Look at his writing. I mean, actually, Alan Jackson, he benefited from some of that himself. He was putting lyrics in songs that you and I couldn't get away with. Mm-hmm. And they became, they became, uh, they really became, what do you call it? They became commercial because it was him. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I wish I could think of a line or two, but we used to laugh at some of the things he would say. And then he, I tell you what, I tell you when he won me over is when he wrote, where were you when the world stopped turning? Oh man, buddy, don't ever tell me he's not a songwriter. Mm-hmm. After that song, mm. yeah, that was such a just a what a contribution to society. That meant everything at that time after nine eleven. That meant everything. That's everything, man. It was so honest, and you know, it even became it was even questionable initially whether or not they would release it. Can you imagine us not having that song? I, I, it just kills me to think about it. Yeah. Sure. That, that was a healing. That was a healing song for a lot of people. Oh, so, songs are healing, man. I mean, that, that's, absolutely. They're very, they're spiritual. I feel like, I feel like writing Ab- a song is spiritual. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's something else I didn't learn to later in life. It's how your songs affect people all over the world, man, wherever they hear. They just, uh, they can change a person's mood. I'll tell you one story I know, I know uh, head on, and that is we, we published a song that Philip White co wrote called, uh, he and D. Vincent Williams called uh, I'm Moving On by Rascal Flats. Yeah. And we got an email after that song came out. And this guy said that he was about to take his own life and heard that song and changed his mind. That's so do we need to say any more about how songs affect people? Yeah, that that, that pretty, man. Much, pretty much sums it up. I'll send this you has that. been a pleasure, man. This yeah, has been a pleasure. Oh, it has for me, man. I've always wanted to uh, always kind of watched you from afar, you know. Never run Thank into you, you at songwriter shows or nothing and so well, we'll have to make we'll have to make that happen. Yeah, you still writing? Uh, yeah, I am. Okay. I'm, I'm working. I'm developing an artist right now. And Jim Ed Norman, have you ever heard of him? Oh yeah, yeah. Jim Ed's Jim Ed's going to produce some sides on him, and we're uh, we're working on that right now. Well, so I'd like to have Jim Ed on. That'd be good too. I, oh man, Peace. goodness gracious! I tell you what, I had a meeting with him, Andrew. It was like talking to the history and the man who wrote it. Mm. I'm telling you, I mean, I just got to mention this. You know, he was a tape copy guy at Warner Brothers. And Clive Davis heard that he wanted to be an arranger. And he sold Clive, set up a meeting with him. And making this story much shorter. He said, why don't you produce a couple of acts for me? And uh, so they, they started going through songs for these acts. And uh, Jim Ed actually turned a song down that Clive Davis really thought was a hit. Well, no, he didn't turn it down. He cut it on him and it, and it, and it didn't work. Mm. But 
But Jim Ed had a song that he loved. And so they cut it and it was his first hit. It was called uh, Right Time of the Night, Jennifer Warren. Can you imagine? Oh, wow. Can you imagine? And then he went on to do all the string arrangements for the Eagles. Mm. The, the first song he did was uh, 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 Desperado. Mm, 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 mm. Can you imagine? God. <laughs> Can you imagine? And then, and then he, uh, now he's out on the road. They're doing a, a tour and he's, he's out directing the orchestra on all those things he arranged. Amazing. And, and much to my surprise, he said, they pick up musicians in every town to do that. I thought they took a what? band, you know, they don't do that. It costs so much. Are you kidding me? He, I am not kidding you, man. He picks them up. He was on his way to um, Canada the last time I heard from him. And he picks up um, union musicians in that town. That is and gives them the sheet music man. and directs them. Man. <laughs> is that a, it's a that's, head shaker. It's all a head shaker. Well, that's man. Really, Everything he told me. That's really cool, though, to give him that opportunity to do that. I, I know. I, it. He, he's, he's living his youth again. Man. And the man's 77, I believe. God. He still seems young to me, but cannot uh, imagine. Yeah. Yeah. He, he went on to, uh, golly, the stories are just, Mm. just endless, endless. Oh, well, man, I know we can talk all day, but uh, I don't want to keep you too long. So, uh, I'll tell you, you not only look like Jamie, you, you sound like Jamie. (laughs) You must sing a little bit like I've heard that too. Yeah, I, got, I, I kind of do sing. It's uh, some, there's similarities in some of it. You, you got some of that soulful Alabama soul stuff. Oh know. goodness, yeah. good for you, buddy. Yeah, well, we won't we won't spread that su- southern right. soul all anywhere we can. I'm telling you, man, Kentucky, <laughs> Kentucky, all these Kentucky boys is you know drowning the Alabama boys out right now with all their talent. Yeah. You know, and, uh, well. Well, they they're good too, man. I, I'm tell you, I'm a huge bluegrass fan. Yeah, me too. And actually, one of my one or two of my songs on this album that I want to do will be will be uh, bluegrass style with a real bluegrass band. And I can't wait. <laughs> That's gonna be fun. <laughs> hey, Andrew. Hey, Ben. Take take care. And uh, yes, sir. You call too. me again sometime. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate y'all watching, picking it out, and we'll see you next time.